Hey everybody and welcome back to my YouTube channel. You know I'm all about growing indoors but today I have actually decided to leave the safety of my apartment to go visit my good friend AJ and her business Growing Grounds to check out her greenhouse. So I thought I'll take you along. Let's go! Thanks for having us. So, uh, welcome everybody, AJ, to the channel. Hi. I think it's our first, it's the first collaboration on the channel. You're the yes. first, you're the first person apart from Brad to actually uh, join us. So, <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having us today. Um, so, to any of you who don't know AJ, AJ owns a business called Growing Grounds. Uh, she's an absolute legend in the plant community over here in Sydney, and uh, she's been in the game for much longer than I have. So, when I started my journey. Well, maybe three years ago or so yeah. we get to know each other so yeah. when i started three years ago um aj was really uh you know uh, an authority to go to in relation to any sort of questions also i got a, a lot of the plants that i'm currently growing actually came from aj so over the last three years she was definitely um a great supplier yes. <laughs> of many <Yes>. plants <laughs> products and so on but we're really going to take you through the greenhouse today i'm going to show you all of the plants yeah. the ones that she's got for sale but also the ones that she's got in her personal collection <laughs> For anybody who doesn't know AJ just yet, um, AJ is obviously Sydney based, uh, but where can people find you? They can find me online or Instagram where I do a lot of my posting of new plants and whatnot at uh, growinggrounds. What is my website? Growinggrounds.square.com. <laughs> yeah something i can't remember <laughs> it will definitely be linked in the description um definitely check out on instagram i think most of the yeah. selling lots of most of the content you put up is on instagram instagram is the best place where you can find what i currently have straight away what's available straight away and also for what's growing um so yeah beautiful come, come and come and join me on uh, instagram yeah. <laughs> and you ship across australia i do so australia is obviously a little bit tricky because we do have some quarantine states but i have got someone that i can work with to get plans to quarantine states so yeah pretty much every corner of australia i can send to so, and if you're lucky enough to be in sydney you can actually book slots yeah. to actually come visit the greenhouse and shop you in can here come as here. well right? you can come Beautiful. here and you can check it out for yourself and you can get to see and learn about plants before you purchase them and i think that's really important especially if you're new to the plant industry or the plant collecting groups let's call it a hobby the hobby <laughs> yeah. yes yes if you're new to the hobby um yeah you can come along and and see and touch and feel before you actually purchase so yeah beautiful especially honestly all plants always look much better in real life than they do yeah. on camera so um it's kind of like the opposite of instagram versus reality at times the texture the velvetness doesn't usually come across so That's i love shopping in person and i love being able to come visit you over here yes so, I thought <laughs> I don't want to waste that opportunity and take you guys along because I'm sure you guys will appreciate. Yeah. So let's maybe start at this end. Come see. Okay, so let's start on this end of the uh, the greenhouse. What have we got? So this guy is called Ace of Spades. Now it's a little bit different to your normal chain of hearts because you'll notice it's actually curling up here at the ends because this guy actually wants to climb. And a lot of people are not very well known with this species. Um, so, or variety within their species but it's actually quite cool if you have a compact space on a windowsill and you want to have a really cute trellis this one's really cool yeah but definitely definitely a trellis like no you don't need you don't need so if you don't have hanging space for this one you can pop it on a trellis and it's super cute and it'll climb around and grow and flower for you as well beautiful easy and you know i'm a i'm a it's sucker big. for all all big leaves so what have we got in the back over there this is what you call a philodendron autumn queen this one's actually desperate for a pole, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, it's very similar to Painted Lady, but you tend to get this more uh, rounded lobe shape at the top and just these incredible colours that fade as the leaf matures. It's just stunning. And if you want more colour to your collection, this one is such a cool, cool philodendron to go with. And, of course, it grows massive. Yeah, we, we love that. <laughs> no, I, that's, 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 that's what I'm all about. Yeah. And AJ, I know you love your begonias. Begonias is something I'm really not 
I haven't really gotten into. So tell me a little bit more about them. I am obsessed with begonias. Begonias, for me, they're my challenge plant. I really enjoy having these plants and growing these plants and being able to supply them to people as well. Once once you kind of get the care down pat and you know what you're doing, they are such a treat to grow. I really, really enjoy growing these because there's so many different colours, textures and varieties. Another really cool thing about begonias is they flower and most of them have all different types of flowers. Some are more clusterous, some are big, some, yeah, some are very dainty. Um, and almost all of them are different colors, which is really cool. Um, but you may have seen some of my earlier videos in, on Instagram where I uh, mocked up, oops, where I did a mock up of uh, pollinating some begonias, which you can do as well. So this one here, this is the female flower with a seed pocket at the back. And this one here without the pocket at the back is a male flower. And you'll notice it looks a lot, a lot more fuzzier in the center. It's because it's holding all the pollen. And there's a female one right next to it. So that's kind of cool. All right. All right. I, I will definitely not put any names of these begonias on there. That's <laughs> way out of my league. Um, but yeah, begonias is something I haven't really gotten into. You know, I love my aeroids, but I get a lot of questions about plants that are a little bit smaller. So, you know, I fit in smaller indoor setting. How do you feel about growing begonias inside? I know you're in a greenhouse over here. We're going to talk a little bit more about the difference between growing in a greenhouse and indoors later. But how do you feel about begonias and growing them indoors? So begonias, look, they're really well known for being a cottage style plant. And I feel like that's true. But there are a lot of exotic begonias that do need humidity and moisture and a lot more light than normal. Um, a lot of begonias, though, have been well known for just basically growing out on a, as a patio plant. And you'll find that the easiest begonias to get, if you really do want to start with them, are what we call cane begonias. And they're, they're begonias that grow like almost like a tree. And they have a trunk, as, uh, as you would say. These are the easiest ones to start with. They don't necessarily need humidity. You may notice I have a humidifier in here, which is beautiful. <laughs> yeah, you might notice it throughout the video. It's very obvious. <laughs> it's not. It's not that it's necessary, but it does help and benefit plants pretty much from any group grow, obviously, other than succulents and cacti. Um, but, yeah, growing begonias isn't as hard as what people think. You just need to get the care right. So basically, in a nutshell, if you're interested in getting into begonias and you're not too sure which one of the 7,000 varieties <laughs> you want to get into, just, just pop me a message. Yeah, just pop into the greenhouse, check it out, and AJ can probably recommend a begonia that fits your environment, right? I'm a, I'm a big believer of just finding plants that work with your environment rather than the other way around, forcing a plant to live in an environment that it's not really exactly. supposed to like. You're, not, you're never going to get the right results. But I'm you really... Don't, you don't need a greenhouse for begonias. You can for some tropical ones, but if you're just starting off and you don't really want to spend uber amount of money you can get ones that are just happy on the kitchen bench on the windowsill wherever in your home as long as they've got bright light good airflow and you don't forget to water them so we moved on to the good part of the greenhouse and this bad boy caught my eye straight away so it's philodendron <laughs> give me your you, give me give me your yeah. version <laughs> so well i'm gonna say it wrong now so there is no right or wrong Hoso bueno but that's really australian yeah it's just a <laughs> I thought it would be Jose Bueno. Jose Bueno. I don't know, but... Wait, this is the Australian version? Jose Bono. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I'm fine. Let's stick, with, let's stick with Jose. Yeah, Jose um, bueno. Anyway, by now, oh, I think we all know which one we're talking about. This is, a, yeah, it's a plant I haven't really gotten into yet. I really wanted to get one, but it's one of these ones that is... It's been really, really pricey in Australia. It hasn't really, it has come down recently, right? Like they are getting more yes. available. So I do have some TC ones, some TC babies that we, I think I've currently got at $145. It's super cute. Oh, this so is, this is the, this this, the, baby. the baby version, but this one has been tissue cultured, right? Yeah, correct. Tissue culture. It's a huge thing in Australia because we obviously have some pretty, pretty strict rules for quarantine. So being able to import things like this in tissue culture is 
amazing because yes it does bring the prices down but it also gives us access to some really cool plants so yes yes yeah. i think we, we've we've had a lot of tissue culture or like a lot of species coming out of tissue culture over the last yeah. couple of years which is which is a good thing right it is um, a good thing it is a good thing and it's a huge learning curve for australia i mean we've had tc for a very very long time but we've never i don't think we have done as much tropical tissue culture ever before like it's really exploded in the past four to five years i'd say yeah so, i mean that's yeah. awesome I, I look i don't mind at all i think there's sometimes a bit of a like a bad reputation with yes. tissue culture people are like oh this one is non-tc so it's like a superior version of a plant how do you feel about that well there's a massive stigma around it <laughs> it it is frustrating to hear people come up with all sorts of wonderful uh rumors and comments about tissue culture at the end of the day tissue culture is fantastic because it brings us like i said so many different varieties but yes sometimes tissue culture can be really bad and, yeah. and it's it, it's not done well but that's fine because then they can just try again with a different mother plant yeah, I suppose tissue culture in itself isn't really the problem. It's more if you are not doing it right or if you're selecting for the wrong one or you're not being patient enough and then you go into production right. with a mother plant that wasn't really suitable and so on. I think that's really where the problem lies. Yeah. Anyway, this one is really stunning. So how lo how old would this plant be? With this plant was a originally a tip cutting um, and it came from a really old plant from Queensland but it has now replaced since replaced all of its leaves so this specific part of the plant is about two to three years old okay yeah because it has, it has been, decent sized leaves so. yeah it has been propagated twice already so what is left of it is um doing very well nice and yes. i see you're also a big fan of the grow verticals yes. i love my grow verticals well, i love i love the vertical support overall but i see that you're filling them with random stuff <laughs> yes so <laughs> Obviously, being outside and having the greenhouse outside, it, it gives me the option to try a different potting medium. Um, I don't use soil. So soil is non-existent in my pots, in my plants. I just, I, just don't, I just don't use it. Basically, for me, it's super important to be able to give the plant as close to its natural growing uh, pattern as possible um, and growing environment as possible. So being able to use these grow verticals means that I can mimic um, what would be in a jungle or underneath a tree canopy for the plant to have to, for the plant to be able to grow to its full potential and actually get to its mature form. So using different mediums helps me achieve that. Now, as you probably already know, syngoniums and monsteras, uh, they're super easy, super, super easy to root and grow and propagate. So therefore I use a bit more of a lighter area medium area medium like this like here on this syngonium fantasy um you can see that i've used coca chips and some coca fiber uh, now in a normal house condition this would dry out super quickly and i know a lot of people don't like using it for that purpose but in the area that i've got it out here in my greenhouse with a high humidity and having the hose very accessible <laughs> i can keep it moist super easily um not everyone can do that so i know that it is different for everyone but for me in my growing conditions this works really really well yeah so as aj said she's actually using these cocoa chips um i'm I, I actually have an experiment on the way at the moment as well i'm experimenting with one cocoa chip pole and a moss pole same species on it same conditions just giving it a try see which one grows better in my environment um, but what aj just mentioned it, it it does dry out quicker than the moss um and if you use these grow vertical poles it's okay because it's also not so messy but if you would put these cocoa chunks in just an open pole the water is really just going to drip through it and make a mess as well so i'm experimenting with it at the moment but i feel like in an indoor setting i found moss to be the cleanest way at this stage um but i'll definitely keep you updated to see how i go with the cocoa chips and the results of the cocoa chips but yeah as aj said i think in a in an outdoor environment where you don't have to worry about water dripping on your floor you know you can have a humidifier and bump this up to 90 percent humidity you are facing completely different challenges or there's a, a set of challenges that we're facing when growing indoors that is just not really applicable when you grow in a in an out, in a greenhouse or outdoors so you have uh, different options to to go with Excellent. all right so i kind of uh while you were researching the pronunciation of the name of this plant <laughs> i actually 
Um, yeah, I spoke a little bit more about the clicker chips and, you know, I think these Grow Vertical poles, the Grow Verticals are also a company, a, a local company, Tim from Grow yes. Vertical makes them and um, yeah. I'm a, I am really like them. Um, but I can see that especially over here in your greenhouse where you can just go wild and water like crazy yes. anyway, I think they are an absolute game changer. <laughs> anyway, this one is, tell us. Yeah, so this is one of my all-time faves, Philodendron Sharonii incredibly beautiful plant like you can't really go past this i heard someone uh purchase one just recently. <laughs> yeah actually so I, I saw one online uh for sale yesterday and you know I, it was juvenile and really small didn't look like much but I, when i walked in here today and i saw what it grows into i actually jumped on and i bought it straight away so is, i'm really excited for this one to arrive this, is, this isn't even its full potential yet either so it's got a lot more growing to do but i really love this philodendron because it's such an easy grower it is a little bit different to other, other philodendrons though whereas its root system is quite dark hmm. even when you think that it's unhealthy it's healthy it's just a very dark color it's really similar to the tenu and I just love the shape of these because they just, they really mimic anthuriums. I yeah, think. it's giving me Vichy eye vibes. Yeah, so. yeah. And I think they're really beautiful to have. They're easy to grow, very compact. You can manipulate it to the pole um, like Jen has done with many other plants. Um, so you can actually make it look aesthetically very pleasing. It is pronounced Jan. <laughs> I was right. Why did you make me say Jen then? <laughs> Anyway, I think we talked enough <laughs> about these plants. We're clearly not super organized, but I, what I did want to point... Uh, you're uh, not going to put all that in there, are you? Please tell me. A lot of things. No. <laughs> Partially. <laughs> we're going to keep this no. really... We're going to keep this realistic. But what I really like is that... <gasps> <gasps> what happened? No, I think it was just the hook. No, boy. What I really... <laughs> what I really like about this very secure setup... No, it's like... But what this I really like is about getting a this, bit intense now. Yeah. I think they might have to turn it off in a minute. What I really like about it is that you just put your grow verticals on a hook and then you yes. just. Yes. I just hook them up. Because obviously I have to use these really like full on shelving. Yeah. Because I use some pretty hefty shelving because of the plants. And obviously I want them to last when they get wet. I don't want them to rust. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I can then hook everything on everything, literally which brings it up off the ground, which in turn is great because you don't want things sitting drainage. on the range. You want good drainage. You want to be on the ground. Bugs, we'll get to that later because <laughs> that I can't even avoid that sometimes. But, um, but yes, I hang them everywhere. And it's brilliant because the back is closed, which means that it'll create little humidity pockets all the way through the pole and it'll keep it a little bit moister for longer. Being outside, things dry out a lot, a lot faster than indoors. So this holds a bit of moisture in for me and I use a ton of different mediums as I spoke about the cocoa before we'll talk about it again but in this one I have because it is new and reached it is just shooting I've decided to use sphagnum in this one. Sweet, but you mix a bit of? Yeah well I like to recycle. Okay. I don't like to waste stuff. I think it's really important you just use literally everything you have. Everything. So yeah. I had some random mix that uh that was left over. And so I just chuck, instead of like, you know, leaving it at the bottom of the bucket, I chuck it in a sphagnum bucket and I mix it around. So sometimes I can have perlite, a bit of extra bark in there. Sometimes it can be sphagnum and cocoa chunks. Um, but really all it is to do is that, uh, to just break it up a little bit. Really? Yeah, I like just, the idea. Just to have a little bit of uh, variety. Just, oh my God, there's so much. I'm a little bit overwhelmed because there's just so many plants. I don't even know which ones to point out because they're all so beautiful. This one, stop right here. This one right here. So this, what have we got? this is Anthurium clarinervum. Everyone knows this plant. It is so widespread now, but there's a reason. I mean, look how gorgeous this thing is. It's super easy to care for. Although it is a little bit of a slow grower, it is just such a beautiful plant. So would you say that's a good anthurium to get started with if, if you don't have any anthuriums just yet and you're worried if, the, if they might not like your environment? Is that a good starting point? I think it could be. I think it's if you've had experience with other plants prior, then yes. If you're just stepping into the hobby, probably not. There are other anthuriums I would recommend before this one, like anthurium vitifolium, like um, some strap leaf anthurium bacurii. They're a lot easier to care for um, and they're a little bit more forgiving when they dry out as opposed to something like this. Although this guy is pretty hardy, 
you don't have to do too much to keep it happy. If you do want it to thrive, though, I would definitely recommend a lot of fertilizer and a lot of humidity. This one is Homlamina camouflage. So this is a really beautiful plant, very easy to grow. It can be grown in and out of humidity. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to have humidity to keep it happy. Um, it does like to have a little bit extra space in its pot though. This one actually gets confused a lot with Pictum tricolor, which is an a, um, aglaonema, not Homlamina. Sounds the same, but very different. Yeah, here's one I have prepared earlier. <laughs> this one's so beautiful. I like um, keeping multiple in a pot to keep it clustered, give it a really thick, bushy look. Um, it has more of a hard stem and um, it flowers a lot. It flowers very frequently. A lot of people do grow them by their flowers and by seed. Um, it is a little bit tricky to say. I haven't accomplished getting some ripe seeds yet, but you can see the patterning is almost identical. It's crazy that two plants can look, two different plants can look almost the same, but they are very different in the way they grow. It is one of my faves. I love this one. And in fact, this one is actually tissue culture as well. We've come a long way. <laughs> long way. So we have parked ourselves at the end of the greenhouse. Uh, this is kind of where most of your private collection is. Yes, I have a lot of my plant babies down here hiding and growing away. Nice. And I found a few very interesting ones. So I just thought I'll want to point out a few ones the ones that i don't necessarily grow myself if i keep if i grow them already then you've probably seen them already but i just wanted to you know give you a little bit more variety and show you different uh, species that, that are out there so first up we've got philodendron rugosum yes pigskin they call it here in australia yeah. i think they call it pigskin i think everywhere i mean I, i'll put these shots up on screen where i zoomed in i mean you can really see it has the most incredible texture and yeah. i actually just got few seeds like uh, like seedlings they're like tiny they're like okay. tinier than my my my, my um, pinky nail um any okay. tips honestly i've had great success with this plant i have heard some people find it a little bit tricky to propagate i haven't gotten to that point yet um but if you're growing it on a grow vertical like this propagation is going to be so easy um it really comes down to just getting it really well rooted into the pole so that when you do make the cuts of the segments that it will survive. But overall, growing this has been a real pleasure so far. It's really enjoyed the, the um, atmosphere that I've created in the greenhouse. And I think having it on a grow vertical has made a world of difference to support it. So Yeah, no, so it's definitely because it's like I've seen it grown not on poles before i think it's the first time i've actually seen one growing on, on yeah, poles so i've never seen one growing on a pole which is crazy yeah and it's clearly have... it clearly attached itself it's clearly yeah. liking it so i don't know what i'm gonna do with mine yeah. when it if it survives the seedling <laughs> stage so that that's very yeah, happy you, know you can come if it doesn't <laughs> thanks <laughs> <laughs> oh but there is so many of my little prized babies growing down here so what have you got there it so looks good. like a ring of fire it is. Um, so this is a really good example of a plant that doesn't vine very quickly like some of your other philodendrons, but it also shows you how happy this plant is actually being in a pole. This is a very small pot for this plant, and in fact, this is actually two plants in one. If you look at the back here, this pole is sorry, this plant has been on this pole for almost, I would say, close to a year now, and the roots are almost reached up to the top here. And it is incredibly happy. It's latched onto this pole so well and is so so rooted, so well rooted in. I don't think I'm ever gonna be able to take it off, but I don't want to. And the point of having it on here is so that it can support it and continue to grow all the way to the top, which it will eventually. Um, but also keep it in a downsized pot. Yeah, I mean that's that's very similar to my approach as well. You know, I, I love using really small pots just to reduce the footprint of the plants because space is precious. So even though you've got a lot of space over here, even you are still trying to save space where possible. You know, I reckon every plant person knows that problem. You have way too many plants and not enough space. So basically, even if the plant isn't necessarily climbing really fast or climbing really high can still give them a pole just to like the pole is basically an extension of the pot but instead of giving it a bigger pot making it a larger footprint horizontally you're just extending the pot vertically because we probably all have more vertical space than horizontal space in our apartments 
and or greenhouses, right? And I mean, I really love this hanging setup that you've got going over here. So I'm assuming these are all grow vertical poles with various different mediums. So we've got some cocoa chips, some moss, some half half, and it all seems to be working. Yeah, show me a few nice ones. This is really what it's all about. Not only does it look pretty, but it's functional for propagation as well. Um, so for me, this is great because I don't have a lot of space outside the greenhouse. Um, that is the same um, humidity and same heat. So what I do is if you can see underneath here, uh, once it's grown to the top, because it's rooted into every node, you can then cut every single node um, and it can propagate right here on the pole. Each node has an activation spot where the new shoot will come from. Um, and yeah, I can leave this on this pole until it actually sends out shoots and have multiple leaves in its own individual plant before I actually take it off and repot. So for anyone that's looking for a safe uh, uh, space saving options, I mean, it doesn't get any better than this really, does it? Yeah, and I, lo I love the propagation benefits of poles, right? I do the same because I like all of my plants to be, I don't, I mean, it depends on the plan, but I don't necessarily like just one vine going up a pole. Like this one over here, this is like your brand, brand Tianum. Yes. Um, you know, I love how it has just multiple plants going up there because the plant, the vines in themselves aren't too large. So you want to make it bushy. So they're a great way of propagating, huh? So beautiful. Alrighty. So you've got a lot of anthuriums here as well. Yeah. Ooh. So I've actually partnered up with someone. So I've actually partnered up with another grower and um, we grow anthuriums together, which is really nice um, because there's so many different types of anthuriums. I think it's a, it's a kind of hobby that you want to uh, take up with a friend so that you can share a collection and hybridize a lot of different things. These particular ones are kind of just coming back from winter. So there are a couple of uh, dried and not so pretty leaves, but you'll notice there are a lot, a lot, a lot of new, beautiful leaves coming out and hardening off like this one it's got some beautiful pink tones in it this little guy here is a little bit more deeper brown you've got some clarinervum hybrids some more red crystallinum hybrids there are just so many different hybrids you can create but the new leaves are just incredible yeah so pretty I really enjoy them. It's something I'm going to be doing a lot more of this season and for the next coming years is um, honing in on some really beautiful hybrids that grow really well in and out of a greenhouse. I think it's super important to be able to have them as just normal house plants as well so you don't miss out on having some lovely anthuriums. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm having that issue at the moment. I started all of my anthuriums in my IKEA greenhouse cabinet, but they've all outgrown it. So now I need to slowly start getting them used to my normal environment. They seem to be going okay after the initial stress of changing, but they're definitely, you know, in the plant world, known to be the rather finicky plants. They probably wouldn't be my first choice if you're not sure about your conditions. I'd always start with like some you know, pothos, philodendron, some epipremnums first. And Thurimus was one of the last genus I actually got into. So I get a lot of questions about how does the greenhouse work and how to replicate the best growing conditions in, in this space. Now, it was a lot of trial and error, I'm not going to lie. It did take me a little bit of time to figure out where the best spot was to build the greenhouse. Yes, I think it's important to learn what your natural conditions are around your home before anything else um, and actually use those to your advantage. Um, one of those advantages for me was that I had a space down the side of my house that was very protected and during summer the sun would rise in the east and set in the west, um, which was brilliant because I would get sun all day long even though I am between two, essentially between two brick walls. Um, that does help contain heat and also expel heat during the times that I need it the most and don't need it the most. Um, but that's different for everyone. During winter is a whole different story. I don't get a lot of light at all, so therefore I take my shade cloth off completely and I'm pretty bare bones for winter. I do use an oil heater in winter to kind of regulate the temperature, not so much keep it heated, but to actually just help the temperature drop gradually 
um, uh, to help the temperature drop, to help the temperature drop gradually, then suddenly and shocking the plants, which we don't want to do. Um, but we do want the plants to be hardy. We don't want them to be complete babies. We want them to be able to survive in an, any sort of growing condition. So keeping it not heated that much is actually a good thing. We've just come through a change. So now we've come into spring here in Australia, um, which means that the shade cloth has to go up, which also means the sun is getting higher. If you have a look at the ceiling, you can see that the sun's just just capping the top of my roof. So the one side of the greenhouse gets a lot more light than the other. Uh, so that's why the shade cloth is only part of the roof wide. Uh, it is 90%. You will find here in Australia, we had a really, really harsh sun. So although you think 90% wouldn't let through much light, it lets through a lot of light. And even during summer, I do need to add another shade cloth on the top of that, which is crazy to think that you could have almost 100% of a weave of shade cloth on but you're still getting insanely bright light coming through but it really is the uv we need to protect from outside it's very harsh uh here in australia compared to other places within europe or in the us um what else can we talk about humidity now obviously being outside plants dry out incredibly quickly and even in winter outside, they do with the heater. So what I do do is I try and replace that humidity and that moisture through this little humidifier that I have built. Now, it's not perfect. It's not the, it's also not it's not the <laughs> a la grandest humidifier in the world. It is literally just a tub of water, two floats and an ultrasonic mister, and a fan sitting up on my shelf that pushes the mist out of the bucket. It can be done a lot better. And a lot more efficiently but I just to be honest I just this just works and it looks great <laughs> this works for me at the moment during summer when the it gets even warmer the humidity rises naturally on its own so I won't even need this humidifier during the peak of summer um, it's more just for winter replacing the heat the heat replacing the humidity that the heater takes away a lot of people ask about airflow in this greenhouse i have doors at both ends and so when it does get quite humid in here i will at least once a day have those doors open for a long period of time to let the exchange of air come through so so thank you so much for having us and thanks for walking us through the greenhouse yeah, basically right. what i got from it is that you're basically facing the same challenges as me or like very similar challenges yeah. right like again everybody's environment is different i mean in indoors it's because everybody's apartment is different you probably have different windows different sized windows so you know those are the things that i'm usually struggling with the most but turns out that even if you're growing in a greenhouse you're really facing the same issues you yes. facing temperature humidity oh, airflow everywhere sun. Is, yeah everywhere is different and every scenario is different i think that's the most important thing when you get into plants, if you're gonna, if it's gonna be a serious hobby for you and not just you know a fiddle fig in the corner of the room, you need to really understand your environment and 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 how to use it to your benefit and what plants to pick for your environment because I think that's the most important thing. And trial and error as well, right? Like I think, I mean, how many things went wrong for you? I mean, I don't actually need you to quantify it, but I'm just saying it's like if it's a rhetorical you, question. Like if you knew, if you knew the money that had shriveled away to a nothing mm. but it's all for the love of a hobby really I, it it's money spent but it's money learned that's what I exactly i feel like if, you know if you kill a plant that's not an issue at all if you got a lesson learned from it right like i always want to find like if something goes wrong i want to find a lesson learned out of it so i can at least do a better job next time around if you just kill plants and you didn't learn anything from it then it's probably a waste but you know, a lesson Maybe learned we'll just... is not a, it's not wasted. That's you didn't it. waste that plant. No. It taught you something that is yeah. invaluable. Oh my god, look at us. We're so deep. <laughs> anyway, I think I think that's it. I think today. that's it. And the, the best thing is this is probably only 50% or so of AJ's collection. So there is a whole yeah. world waiting indoors as well. So if, if you want us to come back and do a part two and look at the inside of uh, AJ's place and look at all of the crazy anthuriums and the anthurium pollination that's going uh, on over there, then leave a comment below um, if you're interested and, um, you know, 
yeah. I might be back very soon. Maybe. In the meantime, please make sure to give AJ some love. So I'll pop in all of AJ's socials in the description down below. Make sure to follow on Instagram. Check out our website. If you're in Sydney, make sure to book a slot to come visit this greenhouse so you can see it in person. Come visit. Definitely come visit because it's just a whole other world when you get to come here and see it. I can only take so many photos. You've, just, you've got to see it with your own eyes. Yes. If you're in Australia, make sure to check out our website and see if there's something that you would like to get from there. And if you're international, because I do know that a lot of the people that yes. will watch this video are international, is there anything you can do for international people? Yes. So I will be setting up an international website soon for accessories. So for clear pots, for Grow Vertical. But everyone has been asking about these clear pots that, uh, wait, now I can't find one when I want to find one. Where is I'm one? sure like 50% of them. Yeah. Beautiful clear pots that everyone has been asking about. Yes, I will eventually have them available to do international shipping. All right, I think we'll wrap it up. All right, and I'm, I'm sure right I'm sure it's not the last time we're gonna go see AJ. Yeah. Okay. Get out, get out. Oh ninety, oh ninety. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye guys. Bye guys. Like, subscribe and leave a comment and I'll see you next time around. Take care. <laughs> Collection. So AJ, for anybody who doesn't know you, where can they find you? In on Rockdown. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, no, wait, just wait, on like wait, Instagram. Wait. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. no, come, come with us. <laughs> come, come. Oh my god. Um, it's literally it's just one of my favorites. I, I I couldn't go past this. I remember seeing it at the Melbourne Sydney plant. <laughs> the, Mel <laughs> the Melbourne Sydney plant guy. <laughs> who is this guy? <laughs> And where does he live? No, I've never seen it. Sharonia. Sharonia. Sharon. Sharon. Shaz. Oi, Shaz. Let's start. Shaz. Okay, so here we are. We, we have. Oh, you know,